I think we are live. How is everybody doing? Let me just make you up to big screen. Okay, I'm assuming other people are going, yes, we have Laura. Woo! Hello. Hi. Yes, how is everybody doing? Is everyone well? All the participants, I was expecting, <laughs> you know, I think it's so funny. I was expecting like voices in my head to be like, yeah, it's really well, because that's what I'm expecting from everybody watching. Yeah, Hi, I can see the chat going, people are typing away. I love it. We've got some, we've got a lot of people joining us today. So I'm just going to move you down here. But do you know what? Let's just, let's hey, go. <laughs> Who we got? Oh, Joe Bradshaw. Yeah. Amazing. Fantastic. I'm just catching it as it comes in. Hi, everyone. So Langley Wotham, whoop, whoop. First one to walk around Wales. I just forget I'm waving and people can't actually wave back. So, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, so we love to see it. Oh, it's amazing. Oh, it's Donna. Oh, mm. Donna. So Donna is a member of my uh, of my community and it is five o'clock in the morning, I think, in Australia. Oh, oh. So tuning in some very far. Well done, Donna. And Ali and Amy, I hope you both are well. So Ali and Amy have just started a new podcast as well called Live Life Differently, which is absolutely amazing. Helen Langridge cycled Got around the world. in Kendall, nice. Beautiful Lake District. Yeah. Oh, amazing. Yeah, let us know where, where you're calling. Yeah, you where is everyone? I'll tell you where I am then, Laura, you can tell me where you are. <laughs> so I'm currently in the northwest of England, a little place called the Wirral. I'm very close to the beach. And I was just... Um, Today it was beautiful blue skies. It was still a little bit chilly outside, but it was glorious. And Laura, where are you? I'm in Essex. We've got no beach and it wasn't quite so sunny. But, <laughs> but that's fine. That's absolutely fine. <laughs> oh, we've got um, London, Scotland. New Forest, London, Dundee. Scotland! <laughs> Bristol. Hi, oh, another Bristol. Scotland! Love oh, it. Oh, so <laughs> Sorry, I'm getting very excited about the Scots in the room. I was literally just like, oh my God, we're getting too excited with just everybody joining us and we haven't even yeah. started the conversation. I know, it's very exciting. It's very exciting. Oh. <laughs> Deep breath. But yeah. um, no, honestly, amazing to have you all here tuning in. It's going to be such a jam-packed, fun-filled live session. Laura, as you probably know, is an incredible adventurer and I'm going to get her to introduce yourself. And Oh my God, it's like I'm doing a podcast. Introduce yourself. I know, yourself. it does feel a bit like a podcast. <laughs> <laughs> Tell everybody a little bit more about you and then, but you're here, we're going to be talking about endurance and mental resilience. So Laura, just go on. Tell everybody, give some people the highlights. Cool. So um, I think a few of you might know me already, but for those that don't, I am an endurance athlete, adventure athlete, kind of interchangeable terms for me, um, specialised in self-propelled adventures, really. So kayaking, a bit of swimming, um, mostly cycling at the moment, um, but I have done some running as well. Anything long distance, self-propelled, um, I think it's a good speed to travel at. Um, and that's where my passion lies, kind of unlocking the endurance capabilities of the human body and exploring the world normally. <laughs> so, I love it. And Laura's done some amazing rides from the Wild Atlantic Way to the Great, great, North, great North Ride. Yeah, so North Sea Cycle Route, that one is. Good. So yep. my, I suppose like my little, my little endurance trips, uh, a couple of them are Marathon de Saab. So running, a few of you in the comments may have heard of it. You may have done it. You may want to do it. You may not. But running six marathons in six days across the Sahara Desert. The longest distance was 52 miles, which was pretty brutal. The year after that, I threw hiked the Appalachian Trail, 2,190 miles in 100 days. And then I cycled down Pacific Coast Highway which was about 4,000 kilometers from Vancouver all the way down to Cabo San Lucas. So we are going to be oh, sharing, <laughs> we are going to be sharing our top tips, our knowledge, what we have learned from doing these big endurance challenges and talk to you about mental resilience. So I'm going to kick off the conversation because we obviously can't ignore the elephant in the room because I know a lot of people are at home. You're probably doing a too many of these Zoom conversations, but the world has changed drastically over the last year with COVID. So there's been tough times, there's been lockdowns, there's been a lot of changes happening. So Laura is going to hopefully, not hopefully, is going to share <laughs> more about, yeah, let's, let's talk about, let's talk about the differences between going mm. on adventures and then, and dealing with COVID. Like how can we apply some of the lessons learned to that? Yeah, I think it's interesting actually, because I think there are some similarities for sure. One of the similarities, I guess, is, you know, it's dragged on a bit. Um, <laughs> it's definitely gone on. The novelty has worn off. 
and there's a lot of that I think that happens on an endurance adventure you know you reach that that point where you're just a bit over it and you you would quit if you can um and I think the one of the big differences I guess so that's maybe one of the similarities one of the big differences I guess is that you choose to be on an adventure you know even when the times are really rough I can sit there and be like well you know I, I did choose this um, both, however, have caused me to dip into my reserves financially and emotionally. Um, you know, I'm sure a lot of you guys can relate to that as well. Um, and I guess a perk is that the food and hygiene situation is better in lockdown than it is on an adventure. So swings and roundabouts there. Um, but I definitely think there's, you know, a lot of resilience lessons that have crossed over from slogging it out on the bike for 11 hours a day to getting through this tough few months we've had as well, for sure. Yeah, I was going to say hygiene. I was thinking, oh no, I think <laughs> mine might have dipped a little bit. Like, what do you care? It's like maybe like once a week if I'm lucky. So I think I... overall I probably smell better though. I mean, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> the At least I have deodorant. Better. Yeah, the food is definitely better. <laughs> I mean, let, let's talk about that a little bit more. So, with like the exercise and doing these challenges, you know, when you've gone out, you're doing these long days, you know, sometimes riding on your bike, bike for like eight hours at a time. What's going through your head when you're doing these long, big challenges? Um, I think a lot of the time, actually, it's very peaceful. And I think this is one of the things I've missed, certainly from spending a lot of time outside, um, is that you, you escape a bit. You know, you're spending way less time in front of your screens and you're just focused on the scenery. Um, so for me, it's, it's just really like this mental clarifying process because you're really present. And as cheesy as it sounds, you know, you're super focused on where you are, on taking in what's going on. You know, your immediate world becomes so much smaller. It's like, where can I eat? And where am I gonna sleep tonight? And is the bike or are my muscles, are they all working? You know, it just, your world becomes much smaller and much simpler. And I think that's actually um, something that I've missed over the last few months that you, ha I haven't had that kind of escape and I've been very much connected, you know, through Zooms and everything else um, and spending a lot more time in front of a laptop than, than usual. I think we all have because even our social interactions have kind of got a bit more digital. Um, yeah. So yeah, actually in terms of what I normally think about on the road, it's, 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 I'd love to say it's really profound, but a lot of the time it's probably just about kind of where I can get some food, what I, you know, how hungry I am. It's just kind of mindless and that just peaceful, the, the peace that comes from being so tired as well and kind of exploring somewhere new. Yeah. It can be, it's very simple. I'm sure people mm. have experienced this. It's very sort of this simple way of living. And I, I really enjoy like the time to like deeply reflect which is I think sometimes we don't really get that in normal life. We're either so busy moving from you know, one thing to the next, whereas actually when you're just on the road and you're just sort of like... Yeah, going, you have time to kind of let these ideas percolate as well. You know, if you've got like a long stretch ahead of you, and you know you're going to be in the road all day, you're not going to be interrupted by phone calls. You know, times like that are when I kind of think that I'm planting some seeds for some ideas in the future. And I think, well, oh, maybe what, what do I want life to look like in a few years? You know, maybe I want to run a farm or maybe I want to do all this kind of cool stuff. And that's when the big ideas start to germinate because you have space to let them, to let them grow. I think one of, the, one, of the thing, one of the interesting topics that I'd love to talk about a little bit more, and, and hopefully you will as well, is it's around motivation. <laughs> so it can be, when you've got like a big goal, like a big challenge, it's, it can be quite easy to almost, uh, or I'm saying this from my personal perspective, but you know, self-motivation to get up to get going motivation during lockdown I have to say for me it's been a little bit like this some days I like surprise myself with how much I've achieved and then other days it's literally like oh my god I've brushed my teeth and that is about it but I'd love for you to share a little bit more about motivation and that classic question you know how do you stay motivated yeah motivation for me is a really interesting topic because largely I have to say I think it's a bit overrated um, and the reason, say what? <laughs> the reason I say that is because um, going back to the idea of an endurance challenge, I can tell you if I've got to get up at five in the morning and I've got a big day ahead of me, I don't feel motivated. Like motivation doesn't even come into it. You know, there is not a morning in hell that I want to just get out of my sleeping bag and hit the road. And I don't think it's motivation that gets me up and gets me at them. I think it's two more important things. One of them is discipline and one of them is habit. Um, and that's certainly true for lockdown. Um, my motivation has done this just like anyone else's. Uh, you know, I'm not, I don't consider myself much more motivated than other people, but I do rely a lot on habits. So for example, if I don't train, 
it feels weird. Like I get to about midday because I always train in the morning. I get to about midday and it just starts to feel really like antsy, like something's missing from my daily routine. You know, it's a bit like I think of motivation like brushing your teeth. Like I don't ever wake up pumped. I'm like, yes, it's time to brush my teeth. And I don't ever go to bed I'm like, yeah, so can't wait. Like it's, it's teeth brushing time. No, I don't, but I do it because there's consequences. And I think that actually we've kind of overlooked the physical benefits quite a lot. You know, when we need to move um, and that's how I think of it in lockdown, especially like it's different if I'm training for, for something that's kind of a separate motivation. But in terms of just general well-being and getting through a pretty horrendous pandemic situation, I think it comes down to something much more simpler. And that it's just a form of self-care, like brushing your teeth is a form of self-care. You don't want to get cavities. You don't want your muscles to be all out of joint, especially because we're all like sat at our laptops so much, you know, moving, going for a walk has never been more important. Yeah, a hundred percent. I think it's one of those interesting things because I sometimes I think people can can look at me and think, oh my god, she's um she's motivated, so motivated. And I do think I'm very motivated, but other times I think I'm one of the laziest people that you can <laughs> ever imagine. But I do think I'm a disciplined, lazy person. Mm. As in, I know what I've got to do. Yeah. Right, when I've got to do it, let's get it done. Let's get on it. Yeah, but. Let, let's sort of dig a little bit deeper into the into these habits and, and I think one of the reasons for doing this it's not so that people can copy your schedule exactly but this is about sort of picking and choosing what bits can I apply to my life what habits um, you know am I doing that are good for me what habits maybe I need to improve upon and get a little bit better so habits do you ha do you have a morning routine do you have an evening routine yeah my morning routine is a bit more flexible I have to say so it has some general components like I make sure I exercise in the morning um, and that's just for me it's a good way to start my day I try not to check my phone I try and have the first couple of hours of just focusing on whatever training I'm doing or if I'm not training for something just doing a bit of yoga whatever it is like I just that's that's how I always kick start my days um, evening is a bit more dialed in I find that I really love my evening routine actually uh, because I struggle to sleep without it um, so my evenings are, are usually pretty pretty set um I try not to have tech after eight o'clock obviously tonight is a wonderful exception um but yeah my phone goes away about eight o'clock usually um and the last couple of hours of my evenings are spent reading so I try and put screens away I don't watch Netflix or anything like that for the last couple of hours I spend the last couple of hours you know just just writing anything down that I need to for tomorrow clearing the brain um and reading and I find that that helps me sleep Oh my god you are, you are, that is so good i I'm, <laughs> i've got to be very careful with myself with netflix because i know that if i start watching something then i'm done like i'm watching the full well, series this is why i have like a i have a cut off at like eight o'clock because you can kind of go either side of that a bit but it definitely means by nine o'clock you know i'm well on my way to to being to sleep i like to go to like at least be in bed by 10 um like 10 30 11 like and that but if it goes past 11 I feel outrageous <laughs> if I'm up at 11 o'clock I, I mean my 20 year old self would be like cringing at this but but yeah like I it's that's what I was saying earlier it's a habit so it starts every now and then it's fine but it starts to feel odd if you go outside of that so what book are you reading at the moment any top tips any books uh, that people should be reading yeah I'm reading what is it called it's I think it's called occasional magic and it's a collection of short stories you know there's the moss um it's an American I think based I've only just kind of downloaded it two days ago so I'm a bit hazy on the details but it's a collection of short stories from people ex achieving extraordinary things so it's all these wacky weird really cool stories um it's called occasional magic Oh, I love that. I think we yeah. all need a bit of magic in our life for them that yeah. moment in time. Really lovely. So I was going to say, um, if you're reading a good book at the moment, which you think other yeah, people should Yeah, I love book recommendations. Please do let me know. <laughs> yeah, pop them in the comments. And I'm going to start trying to read a little bit more in the evening because I know that I am bad with my screens. It's One so the easy though, isn't it? Well, you know, that's I think that's why I put in the eight o'clock thing because we do it without realising. Like yeah. you just sit there scrolling, scrolling and you're like, what the hell are you doing? Stop it. <laughs> yeah, stop it. Just, yeah. just like my posts. Um, yeah. Just keep following me, Laura. Do you follow everyone? Yeah, else? exactly. <laughs> one of the great things that um, is about habit building. So when you can sort of nail one habit, you can then sort of start adding on the rest. So for me, that's, um, and this is going to sound really ridiculous, but it's 
it's drinking water. Mm. I know that if I'm drinking enough water, I'm going to have a much more productive day because I'm just going to be healthier. I yeah. know that sounds weird, but I can add on more stuff to my day. But if, what would be like one of your top habits, favorite habits, you know, that really works for you that when you're yeah. doing it, you feel amazing drinking water? Um, I can offer a really cheesy one, actually. Um, this is something I started doing maybe eight years ago now when I was in a job that I absolutely hated, really struggling. Um, I started doing a gratitude list every night and I'm rolling my eyes as I say it because I, it just sounds so cheesy and I know it sounds like super cheesy, but it's, for me, it's such an important way to end the day um, and it becomes even more important in times like this because I, you know I'll have a really awful day um, and actually, just making a list of three things that I can be grateful for. I just find helps me reframe it that actually there was a pocket of goodness in that day that otherwise I would totally overlook before I go to bed. And I do, I do it on adventures as well. Like I do a mental list. And I, again, I find it really helps because if I've been battered by the elements all day and I've run out of food and I'm eating like a stale wrap for dinner um, I, and I make myself find something, you know, that's gone well. And actually I just, I just find it helps refocus it through a bit of a different lens. Um, and that, again, I guess that helps with motivation because a lot of motivation slips when you just start to feel like things are spiraling down. Um, but if you celebrate your little wins and you celebrate something you have to be grateful for, I do think it kind of adds up and it helps. Oh my God, massively. I, I remember when I was on the Appalachian Trail and on the Appalachian Trail, they have these white blazes on the trees which you follow through the woods and you're walking through. It's sometimes called the green tunnel as you're, as you're walking through. And you can actually feel yourself sometimes going into that like sort of negative sort of spiral. It's like, mm. oh my God, it's cold, it's wet, my feet yeah. are hurting, I've still got miles to go. And for me to flip the, the mm. switch in my head was gratitude. And so every Massively. time I saw a white blaze, <laughs> I'd be like, right, what can I be grateful for today? Oh, I love that. Whether it, my favorite one was like, I've still got a Snickers bar to eat. So it's like, you know. <laughs> it's always food, it's always food. <laughs> I try, I try not to make it always about food, but <laughs> food on adventures does rate pretty highly. Oh God, yeah, and in lockdown. <laughs> but no, I think because, you know, our brains are actually wired to look for the negative. And I find this, my default state, especially if there's something going on, like if there's a big project that I'm working on, I find, this is why I keep a journal next to my bed and I try and keep screens away because the last thing that my brain decides to do really helpfully before I go to bed is come up with all the things that can go wrong. So, for example, when I was preparing for the Great North Ride and I was, I was just lying there one night being like, oh, what if like an, an army of rats like invades my tent and there's like hundreds of them? What would then happen? And I'm sat there being like, that's really not a good time to be contemplating this. So, yeah, again, like that gratitude thing just kind of quietens down that bit of your brain that's wired to look for stress as a survival mechanism. Do you know what? I'm just gonna I'm just gonna add on to that because this is actually one of um, actually Ali Mahoney uh, Johnson who is watching them on the panel list. She first got me started because I I heard her give a talk at the Women Adventure Expo. One of the things that she talked about was doing something called a what if list. So I love we'll take your example. What if I do you know a hundred rats do sort of enter my tent? What do you do about it? And it can end up you know freaking them out when it's going around and around in your head. Yeah. And um, one of my practical things is literally getting a pad of paper, a piece yeah. of paper, Laura line, Laura, Laura line, Laura <laughs> line down the center and the left hand side. That's when you write down all of these yeah. fears, these what ifs, you know, yeah. what if I lose, lose my yeah. backpack? What if I run out of food? What if I run out of water? It's getting it out of your head, isn't it? Yeah. It's so important. Yeah. But, but then the follow on is actually is filling out the right hand side column. But I do that. How I do that is I would like sit in a bath, have a glass of wine, <laughs> sit somewhere really comfortable and, like, mm. and really contemplate the answer. You know, what would I do if the if a hundred rats did enter my tent or what yeah. would I do if I faced the bear? And then I sit down <laughs> and write it out. But that's so powerful because your brain is then actually yeah. going through it in your head. Yeah, definitely. Like I do the same, actually. So I have this um, notebook next to my bed and anything like that pops up. I write it down and I'm like, OK, so that I can logistically work out what that is you know like what like if my if this broke and I'm like well reasonably I can fix something or I can find someone that can fix it you know there's there's a logical answer for it and then also I think it's really important to write it down because in a more logical when you go to go through it and do what you're doing you're talking about going through it you can also remind yourself of the likelihood of that actually happening um so when I felt my first trip cycling across Ireland I was like oh what if this serial killer like it's just lurking and it's like 
cool what are the what do we think the the actual statistics are for that scenario and it's like good reminder good reminder yeah. really really low I remember when one of mine uh, mine came true but I didn't have quite the reaction that I should have done it was so when I was on the Appalachian Trail I was walking along you know in my own little world and then a baby bear oh. little bear cub. I know that's the reaction I had I was like oh it's so cute like the cutest bear ever quickly followed like two seconds later by like Oh no, where's my <laughs> Okay, right, think back to my list. What do I do when a bear's here? Okay, walk back slowly, make some noise. Well so done. Between the bear and the bear cub. Well done. We're, we're, we're covering off, we covered off sort of, you know, motivation. We've broken that down into, do you know what? It's about discipline, it's about habits. And these, these are all fantastic, but sometimes you can be in a rut. Mm. You can be in a, in a little bit of a hole. You can be in a place okay. where you don't necessarily want to be. And I think one of the interesting things for me is it's like, how do you take that first step to, to get out of the rut? And I'd, I'd love to hear your, your advice for people who are, you know, stuck in a rut. Yeah, um, it's so easily done. I think especially at the moment, I think that's a, a big thing right now because all the things, I mean, personally for me, all the things that I normally do to get re-inspired aren't really possible. Um, you know, lots of us, we're just kind of literally stuck, um, which is rut conducive isn't it it's very conducive for getting stuff in a rut um so for me there's a couple of things really I think take that first step whatever it is like if it's if it's a one percent of what you want to do so say one of your you want to get back into running um just go for a walk you know just start however small you need to start just do a token gesture towards it. A big one for me when I used to struggle to get up in the mornings and actually still do this, is I tell myself I can just do the first five, 10 minutes. I can come home if I want to. So I'm like, okay, you don't have to do the whole bike ride. Just, just go out for 10 minutes. If you still want to quit after 10 minutes, you can come home. I would say nine times out of 10, by the time you're out the door, you won't, you won't, want, you won't need to come back. You'll have already broken that habit. Um, but lying to yourself and telling yourself that you can come back after 10 minutes is quite helpful. Um, something else that I think can be really powerful is make a list. I obviously love lists. Um, <laughs> Why? Don't worry. <laughs> default answer to anything, make a list. Um, but maybe take some time and write out why that is important to you. So like, I want to get back into running. Why does it matter? Why does it matter? And what are the consequences if you don't follow through? So like, if you want to get back, you'd be like, oh, I need to be healthier. And actually I'm starting to notice that my health is suffering. My mental health is suffering, you know, and then you're faced with the consequences of not doing it and all the reasons why. And I think it's really important to check in with that initial kind of impulse, why you wanted to start something. And then I guess um, this goes back to what I said, just kind of taking that first bit, just break it down. You know, it's that age old thing of how is a marathon run? It's run one step at a time, um, you know, and I think you just have to give yourself permission to, to start without seeing the end in mind. You know, something is always better than nothing. And I think that as soon as you start, the feel good factor of having broken that will then actually build some momentum and get it going. Yeah, I do you know one of the things that works for me um, and I do you know what? I'd love you all to try it and let me know what you think is, is, I don't know, sometimes people have these certain songs, which just like, you know, you hear them oh, and it's yeah. like, and like, it just raises your heartbeat and your energy. And you're just like, <laughs> dancing like this, a good playlist and a list is me yeah. off to the races. Oh my God. We're taking lists to playlists. <laughs> yeah. I mean, like, honestly, it's about sort of changing yeah. that state and changing 100%. your energy. So yeah. find a good playlist or find a good song, put it on, have yeah. a boogie in your pajamas. I was gonna say, one of, one of my tips for getting out running, and this is gonna be good for me next month because I'm doing um, run one mile every day in March challenge. And um, sometimes I know that when I wake up in the morning, I can't even be bothered say to put my running gear on. Sometimes <laughs> I'll actually sleep in it the night before. So when I wake oh, up, it's like, I'm good it. to go. <laughs> Let's go for a run. They got no excuses then. You're <laughs> literally in the gear. I love that. <laughs> So say we've got we've having by the way thank you everybody for your book recommendations yeah they i'm good i'm loving through. this they are fantastic <laughs> i keep being like oh there's another one <laughs> that'll be good that'll be good but we are going to be answering questions from you as well so i've got a question here from from megan so thank you so much megan so this is a great question with the unpredictability of the last 12 months um has it been difficult to motivate yourself to plan the next adventure knowing it might not happen when you want it to um, so that's question. Uh, yeah, I'll read it all. So how do you cope with plans changing? 
Um, you know, and you know, my motivation has fluctuated so much, particularly over the last few weeks, and it's exhausting. Megan, I totally agree, it is exhausting. So yeah. let me just go back to that question. So um, has it been difficult to motivate yourself to plan the next adventure, knowing it might not happen when you want it to? And how do you cope with plans changing? Oh, yeah, I mean, wowzers, what, what a year. Um, it has been incredibly difficult. Um, I think I said this when we spoke earlier in the week, Sarah, that the year I had planned versus the year that I got, um, you know, was, was really something. Um, and there is that, you know, I think it's really important to acknowledge when the curveball hits and when it really hits and it wipes the wind out of you. And, you know, I think it's really important to not try and gloss past that and to allow yourself some time to adjust that you had this big, amazing plan um, that this pandemic wiped out or whatever it is. And I have I have personally found it. I've had that moment of being like, oh, I'm trying to plan for this. I don't know what's what's going to happen. Um, and I think the only coping strategy really that I've relied on consistently is one, you just got to focus on the next bit. Um, so I've made some plans. I mean, it, in some ways it's been easier after the initial hit of lockdown because the first thing that when it happened in March, it was completely blindsided. And I was like, wow, that's just wiped out my entire year. This time I'm, I've made plans and all the rest of it, but I'm kind of half tentatively being like, well, if that has to move, it might have to move. So I'm kind of got half an eye on the news headlines. So I'm kind of already in a better place than I was this time last year. Um, and just, I think all you can do is take one day at a time. Um, as cheesy as that sounds, but you know, actually, although this is a really extreme example, none of us really, I mean, we can make plans. None of us really know if they're ever gonna happen. So this has just been like a masterclass in adjusting to when life throws you curveballs left, right and center. Um, for me personally, I've taken the last few months to really reconsider. Um, and I've been like, is this something that I still, is this an arena I still wanna work in? Is this something that I'm doing? Um, and luckily I've, I've navigated my way through that, um, but I don't think that's a process that can be rushed. I think you have to give yourself time to adjust and just then, because there have been times when I felt completely overwhelmed, bringing it back into that, you know, okay, what can I do today? I don't know what I can do next month, but I know what I can do today. I know what I can do to make today a better day. Um, and that's actually been a bit more of a focus than, oh, what amazing endurance challenge can I do in a couple of months? It's like, well, let's just actually focus on today. Let's see, you know, if I can shut my gremlin down today and what can I do in the meantime? Because it is a, you know, it's an unprecedented precedented time isn't it um sorry bingo to... sorry yeah sorry. <laughs> i know i know um but yeah i think you have to allow yourself to go through it and then just trust that nothing lasts forever um yeah i don't know if that answers the question but i guess yeah. it's like on a, in a challenge when you're having a really difficult day um i break it down into the next mile the next you know the next town the next bit and i think that's something that i've been doing a lot throughout this as well I suppose my answer when I think about it, and, and this may sound a little bit weird, but it's made me realize like how much I enjoy like planning and looking at different types of adventures. So I actually start, I like, I do like the research side of things. Mm. You know, when I start to think about, you know, for example, like the Tiora Trail in New Zealand, and then I like watching the YouTube videos and I found a couple of people who've, you know, done it before and I've read their books and listened to a few podcasts. And then I, I basically, I give myself permission mm. to dream and to think about it and to imagine myself sort of out there. But on the flip side, I'm also being very realistic. You know what? If it happens, it happens fantastic. Yeah. If it doesn't, yeah. that's okay too, because I can still really enjoy this whole process of yeah. writing my to-do list and gear I think list. I've gotten much better at not being attached to it. So when it first hit this time last year, I had like all my hopes pinned on this thing that was happening in the year that I had planned out. And um, as I said, like that made it really difficult. This time round, I'm I'm already kind of less attached and I'm trying to be a bit more flexible with it. And I'm like, okay, what are my options? So I've got about five different plans that I think will work for about five different <laughs> levels of whatever is going on. Um, so yeah, it's a lesson in adaptability, isn't it? And flexibility, which I guess is, is good anyway. Yeah. And, and like, you know, the second part of that question was around like plans changing. Mm. And I think sometimes it comes down to you've actually got no control over a lot of things. Like, oh, yeah. you know, if you, if you imagine you know, when you're, when you're out in, you know, if you're out in the, in the mountains and, or you're out hiking or cycling or something, 
that sometimes what you can control really comes back to you and your yeah. mindset 100%. and you know, what's going on. And Joe Bradshaw actually had a great tip, which I learned from, from Joe when she was climbing Mount Everest, which was, and I hope I say this right now, it's about <laughs> um, attitude over altitude. Oh, I love that. I, I hope I've said that right. But it is, it's basically, it is about your, your attitude and your view and thinking, okay, well, how can I react to this situation? You know, yes, I can get angry, annoyed, uh, you know, upset, mm. frustrated, or you can take the lessons from it and take the positives 100%. from it. So, um, yeah. also, I mean, I think, yeah, I think I'm a big fan of always trying to find something, like find a pocket. I've been calling them pockets of goodness over the last few months. Um, and I, you know, whatever they are, um, I've been really trying to seek them out, like actively, which again goes back to the gratitude thing. Like I, I really find that very helpful. Um, and actually Rachel has just said, you know, how she had to cancel some plans and that led to her discovering some, you know, incredible things locally, a bit more locally. And I think that's really worth highlighting too. You know, actually there are some, some plus I did a, like a bike ride last year that I would never have done um, otherwise, you know, it has taught me to kind of reappreciate and rethink a few things like that. Absolutely. And the, the last part of Megan's, Megan's question was sort of around exhaustion. And mm. I want to link this to, um, to stress, basically, mm. because it has been, you know, I'm not going to lie, it's been relentless. Stress, <laughs> stressful, it's been <laughs> relentless, I'm sure. Yeah. Every day. But I'd love for you to talk more about mm. stress, dealing yeah. with this stress, like how, yeah. Yeah, I think, thanks so much for bringing this up, Sarah, because I think stress is such an important topic. Um, and it goes back to the stress cycle um, that I think we all kind of have heard about once or twice and then kind of tentatively know about it, but forget about it. But um, I found myself pretty burnt out in December. So I did a lot of research into stress and the, the term burnout. Um, and so it comes back to the stress cycle, which as a little recap, um, back back in the day when we're chasing around, you know, if we, we came into, into contact with a saber-toothed tiger, so that's that's a stressful situation. Um, yeah. So we have we have the three responses, right? So we either have the fight response, which is like, oh, I'm going to take on the tiger, like let me at him. We're going to flight. We're going to we're going to run away. Or one that I hadn't actually heard of, which is freeze. Um, so I knew about fight or flight, and I didn't know about freeze. And freeze is basically our last ditch resort. So if you've ever been watching uh, an Attenborough documentary and you see the gazelle just go limp. In the jaws you know it's realized it can't run it can't fight and it it's nervous literally shuts down as the best it's to play dead um what then happens after each of those three stress things um you either run it off or you get back and you have this physical reaction if you've ever seen anyone come out of a surgery as well um they their body will start to twitch and that's because they've been induced into the freeze part of that stress response um the roundabout way of me saying this is that stress obviously results in a physical stress response in the body. So we're talking about all those stress chemicals that flood our system, either to run away, to fight, or you know, to shut down. And the thing I think we forget is that that then needs a physical response to let your body know that the stress has gone, which is something I didn't think that I really paid enough attention to you last year because obviously we're getting bombarded with stress a lot at the moment and we're not labeling it um, as stress because it's just we're watching the news and we can feel we're getting a bit anxious but that's the last we think of it um, and that then that then obviously accumulates in the body so I think one of the reasons I'm so keen to advocate you know moving your body is because it's the most effective way to signal that the stress has passed it's the most effective way to ditch those stress hormones. The other things you can do are kind of let it out. You can just have a cry, have a scream, whatever, but it needs to be physical. You know, we're physical beings and like just kind of watching this and then trying to ignore it isn't going to do it. That stress, the stress hormones and stress chemicals, sorry, build up into your body. And that's when you burn out because it will just, it will completely weigh you down. So I think it's really important to remember that you need a physical reaction to the physical symptom, the physical thing of stress. Um, like doing anything creative does it breathing is a really important way to do it but again it needs to you know you need to match physical with physical um, which was a big learning for me last year someone's um noticed uh someone's mentioned the chimp paradox really great book um another one i can recommend is a book called burnout um which is one i really enjoyed last year but um yeah it's really important i think to not underestimate 
the stress that comes from this situation um, because it's it's kind of just simmering in the background um, kind of omnipresent and we don't think of it because we haven't had like an acute stress situation um, but yeah it's still it still kind of builds up in the body system which I think is really interesting. I mean, one of the things that you talk about there is the power of exercise. And James has asked um, a really great question, which says, James wants to know is, do you exercise every day? Some days I just can't do it, but no, I'll feel better. Do you make it a habit to exercise every day? I do. I do. Um, not every day is like a hard as nail session on the bike. Sometimes it's just like once a week, I, it's just yoga and a walk. Um, and I think that's the most important thing. Um, for me like I'm I train quite hard because at the moment I'm training for something and you know I, I it makes me feel better anyway I quite like that but um, taking all that to one side I actually don't think it really matters what you do um, you know if yoga is your thing do some yoga obviously I hope the gyms and stuff open up soon because I know a lot of people you know it's, it's hard to find the motivation to work out from home as well I can I completely understand that that takes a whole nother level like I feel like I live my life in this room it's where I train it's where I work <laughs> you know so I get that um but yeah absolutely um I just think doing anything is always better than nothing um and again just do it with that kind of five minutes in mind like I really don't feel like doing this okay so today I'll just do 10 minutes and I do this with my walks like I'm really over the same laps that I've been doing, like the local walk. Um, and I, I make myself do it in five minutes in. I'm like, yeah, this was a good idea, actually. Um, it's the same same lap, but still good to get outside. <laughs> I have to say, so I wish I could say that I exercise every day. And unfortunately, <laughs> it's sometimes it's just not the case because um, my bad habit is because I, I work from my bed and my laptop is down <laughs> on the right hand this side. This horrifies so me. Just so you know, <laughs> it really stresses me out. <laughs> So I wake up and I literally grab my laptop, yeah. pull it up, because I, I basically, I don't like sitting behind there. So I actually work lying in my bed, lying down, which I'm pretty true about. I love it. My bed is amazing. <laughs> it's my really comfortable habit. Anyway, getting away from my bed and focusing on the exercise. <laughs> so, I mean, what, what I've, um, for, for me, I've broken it down to almost two things. That one of them is something is better than nothing. Uh, 100%. Someone, yeah, like the even and this, uh, we, you know, we've got a kettlebell here. Sometimes I just go in, I do 15, 20 kettlebell swings right, until yeah. my glutes start to hurt. And then I'm like, do you know what? I've done something. Yeah. The other, the other thing, a bit random, um, is sometimes when I'm walking up the, the stairs and I'm like, okay, I really haven't done any exercise, I will drop onto the stairs. So I'm on the stairs <laughs> and I will do some push ups. <laughs> While, while I'm waiting, <laughs> another random one, which you can all try tonight when you're brushing your teeth, is try balancing on one leg. So you stand up, you're brushing your teeth, holding your leg up, and just <laughs> your balance. It's a little bit of fun, but actually you're squeezing your glutes, you're squeezing your core, you, you know, you're engaging a few of your yeah. muscles. So um, my friend Jules actually does something really cool with brushing. You just remind me when she brushes her teeth. So she's got the timer for her electric toothbrush, and she does squats just in that two minute yeah. timer. At the end of the day yeah. so i think um someone has just said movement instead of exercise and i think i think that's yeah. it i think that's exactly the point um and it goes back to what i was saying you know i don't feel motivated to brush my teeth but i do it because i don't want my teeth to, to fall out um and i think it we need to get away from this idea that exercise is some kind of punishment for like the pizza we had last night um it's whatever makes you know it's just something to check in with your body make yourself feel good and something as you said and we've both said is always better than nothing and even just, you know, a good morning stretch in the morning. Mm. Just like, you know, that's a nice thing. Oh, that feels it. really good. Now, everyone do that. Roll your shoulders, yeah. stretch up. You'll feel good. A little bit of movement. I love that. Doing squats while you're brushing. Yeah. A few other people, people are doing that. Yeah. Okay, so we've got, we've got quite a few questions coming in. So uh, let, let me just see. Okay, this is, so John Baptiste, um, who's on Facebook, asked, how do you keep your focus on your routine when you get injured? So unfortunately, it happens mm. to him too often. So John Batsby, I'm so <laughs> sorry. I have to say I've been injured. I know the pain. Oh, it's the worst. <laughs> if, you, if you follow me on my podcast, you're probably like, I know Sarah's going to mention her. I've got lazy glutes and my hip Oh, we all flexors. have lazy glutes, yeah. Lazy glutes and tight hip flexors. Yeah. But, but let's Welcome to the club. Because you've actually, um, I remember you shared about sort of dealing with your injury before mm -hmm. the, um, or you got injured on the NC500 when you, when you were up in Scotland. And I did. 
maybe just sh- talk a little bit through, you know getting through that process yeah um that was that was awful I have completely sympathized because um you know it, it, injury does make me grumpy I'm not you know I'm not going to sugarcoat it it obviously does make you grumpy if you're used to doing it especially I'm quite used to doing quite a high volume so if I ever need to not do that because I've got injured um I'm pretty grumpy but um a couple of things on that I now prioritize yoga and strength training because that I haven't been injured since um in a in that I think Scotland was a couple of years ago now so um yeah I think that's massively important for preventing it um I do 20 minutes of yoga every day most days just with that in mind um and then I guess if you do have an injury work out what you can do um so for example when I I pulled the my quad um, which meant cycling was out, uh, running was pretty much out as well. But there was still some stuff that I could do. Um, so I focused a lot on rehabbing it um, and also just tried to put my my excess energy into other projects. And this happened a bit in lockdown as well. So I, I started baking um, and it's just something just to get. So I wasn't sat there scrolling on my phone, being a grumpy sod. Um, it's just actively putting your attention elsewhere like I nearly started knitting um I haven't done that yet but it did I you know I think anything you know just with this excess time that you have rather than sit there being like I should be doing this right now just figure out something else that you've always wanted to do maybe like another hobby um yeah it is really tough I think um I channeled a lot of energy into into rehab um so that's a lot of foam rolling like a lot of lacrosse ball a lot of of that sort of stuff um, I was gonna say yeah. it's all and um, the this I think this is the thing that I found really frustrating is it's all the really little exercises which yeah. are the most important like I had like a band around my foot and I had to move my foot like this <laughs> and I was <laughs> just like oh or I had to push up on my tiptoe this is like my calves and stuff mm. and I was you know I do eight and then it was like done I was like yeah no, but I used to lift big heavy weights yeah. and it- well, I mean this is the thing about running especially because um I came to running from a cycling background so obviously had lazy lazy glutes and overactive quads um that old chestnut and so they would always go through when I teamed up with the running school like years ago now but they would always go through like a pre-running warm-up and I did it for a while and then I was like oh yeah whatever he's got time for that I just want to go out for like a 20 minute run I've got some time between I want to do that and honestly it takes five minutes um and it less than that sometimes it's like a three minute thing just to act to activate the glutes and I, I haven't been injured since so it is normally like these small little things into your everyday um you know and again going back to like the movement rather than exercise thing um you can you can pepper in little 10 minute breaks of movement throughout your day for sure even if you don't have time to do a workout session like you said you know you're on the stairs you're doing something while you're brushing your teeth um, all those little things really add up. So I'm going to, um, we've got a great question here around on the top. So this is from Ali. So thank you, Ali. Great question on the topic of resilience, which I always want to do with, yeah, resilience. Yeah. <laughs> can you think of a time, I'll let you go first so I can think about my <laughs> Can you think of a time on one of your adventures where you, where your own resilience has surprised you in a good way? Oh, what a question. I can't believe you're making me go first. Okay, I can go. I can go. <laughs> I've had time to read it so I'll read it again for you so yeah on the topic of resilience can you think of a time on one of your ventures where your own resilience has surprised you oh I've got ready? one yeah so, all right so, uh, so mine was for me was on uh, when I was on ma- marathon subs I was out in the middle of the Sahara desert I'll set the scene for you imagine undulating sand dunes as far as the eye could see and um it was starting the sun was starting to set and to go down I'd run, uh, make, I got to like 34 miles or something and I was feeling like pumped and pretty epic. I just climbed to the top of this sand dune and looking down, I was like, this is what I have trained for. So I will get onto the resilience bit a bit, but tightened up the straps on my backpack, took some sips of my water, had some salt tablets and started running down these sand dunes with these big long steps. And you know, this you is can glorious. Like, we need a look. soundtrack to this at the moment. <laughs> exactly, but that's in my head. I was literally like this, like beautiful flowing mm. runner, you know, just everything just <laughs> in flow. And I was like, oh my God, I've only got like 20 miles to go. This is gonna be a piece of cake. However, 
about 20 minutes later i suddenly hit like the dark tunnel oh, so cruel. <laughs> it was just like it just went into this negative spiral where my body was like what are we doing my feet hurt sarah this is you know the negative voice in your head i think you know you talk about like your inner gremlin and we'll come yeah. to that a little bit later and uh, got to this really to be honest this really really dark place where i was literally like i've got to stop i'm going to cry i'm going to hit my you know sos button i need i need help here like uh, how am i going to continue it's getting so dark and I remember there was almost this like, it was a, a flip of the switch in my head where it was changing it around to like, right, what can you focus on? Okay, let's break this down. Like you're obviously working in five mile distances isn't working. Right, can you focus on the next mile? No, okay, I can't, you can't focus on the next mile. Okay, what can you focus on? What about steps? So I was like, okay, steps, can you make, can you make 10 steps? And I was thinking, oh, that might be a bit difficult. Four. That was the number I settled on. I could manage four steps at a time, but I'd slow down so much in my head. All I was having to shout to myself was literally step, 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 (laughs) step, step to keep on moving forward. But then I slowly got out of it and we built up from four steps to 10 steps, back up to half a mile, a mile to five minutes to 10 minutes. And I think that changed a lot for me because Mm. it was, it was about breaking it down into these little habits and, and also just feeling really proud of myself thinking, hold on. I'm out here in the middle of the desert by myself. There's no one else to, you know, to rely on. It's just me. And, you know, I, I did that. So anyway, yeah. that's, that's, I hope that's restored. Oh, I love that. But, I love that story. And I just forever now got this image of you, like with the soundtrack and it's glorious. That's going to be my motivation. The next time I go for a run, I'm just going to think of you with the soundtrack. Sorry, it's a choir. Great yeah. question, Lindsay. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Um, the one that immediately sprung to my mind as well was actually quite similar. Um, it was when I ran across Fuerteventura. So very similar terrain, like arid, desert, completely like disgustingly hot. Um, and I, up until I did that, that run, which is 100 miles end to end. Um, so it was four marathons in four days hadn't really done anywhere near enough training for it. Um, So I basically spent four days in my pain cave, absolutely broken. Um, Like day one was kind of okay, but I think from day two onwards, I woke up every morning with one thought playing in my head, I don't think I can do this. Um, You know, I'm quite a a strong cyclist and I've got some experience there. Um, But this run was like my, my running like demon. Um, so it was like the first long run I'd ever done. Um, and every morning I was, I just woke up with this story in my head of like, what the hell are you doing? You're not a runner. Like you are not a runner. And it, it was so loud. And I, I, I mean, I had my friend Tessa with me. We had our, our, another friend with us trying to take photos for us for this magazine thing we were doing. And I was just like, oh, you're going to have to go out into this apartment. You're going to have to tell them you can't do it. And I never quite managed to like pipe up to them every morning that I couldn't do it. Um, so I, I, I think I confessed to my friend Tessa on day three. I was like, Tessa, I'm not sure I can, I, I can do it. My, my legs were kind of okay. My feet were revolting. Um, like you've never seen anything like it. Like they were basically mummified by the end of day two, like blisters on top of blisters. Um, so that was my real, my real pain. Um, and I honestly thought up until the moment we crossed that finish line on day four, I didn't think I was going to do it. So um, every morning I woke up and I was like, oh my God, I, I can't do it, I can't do it. And then I was like, I'll just do the morning. And so I was like, okay, we'll get through the morning. I'll just get, it's exactly the same as you just said, like, we'll just break it down into what I can do. Um, and I did, I had to do that sometimes minute by minute, um, like signpost to signpost, hour by hour. And I, like, I remember day two, day three, day four, like every night I finished, I was like, I can't believe I actually got through today. Um, but then we'd wake up the next morning and be like, oh, I, I can't, there's no way I'm doing it. I'm going to have to tell them I can't do it. Um, and actually it was exactly the same process of like, let's just break it down. Let's do one step at a time. Um, we'll just get to lunch. We'll just get to lunch. So I can quit after lunch. Um, and then I would have like an orange Fanta at lunch and I'm like, okay, just see if you can do another hour on the trails. Um, let's just see if you can do that. Um, and I remember actually finishing when we finally reached like the end of it. And I was just like, oh my God. Like I just, and th- and it's like my little, if there was like a little running gremlin, it's like he evaporated because he had nothing left to say. Cause it was just that moment of actually proving that this story I had about myself, about not being a runner um, was complete nonsense, which I think is really important as well. Because I think we do tell ourselves stories about the things that we can and cannot do. Um, growing up, I was like, oh, I'm just not very athletic. 
Um, and that was like an identity that I had really strongly. Um, and it was the same with running. Um, and it's, I think that strategy has actually played out in so many different ways on so many different trips um, of, of just, just get through the next hour and then you can quit and just kind of chunking it down. Um, and I think that is pretty much how anything has ever been done. <laughs> I think what's really what's really interesting there is you talked about like you know your your inner gremlin your, you know your inner voice that that <laughs> I don't, inner beep who can sometimes be <laughs> not very nice to you yeah um, but Sophie's got a great question here is um, and this is all this is to do with the people not I'll let me answer let me ask the question first so Sophie asked how do you deal with the naysayers she worries about other people's doubts. Oh, sorry, worrying about other people's doubts about her ability. I know I could do A, B, or C, but then don't want to tell people about ideas because I don't want them to tell me that I can't do it. Mm. So how do you deal with doubt with um, with doubts like this? So this isn't the internal. This is other people doubting oh, your good. ability. Yeah, love, I'm literally. Love. I want to be like, get away, yeah, get away. Love, love you know that. Like yeah, it's good. Um, I think I figured out very early on um, with my first, my first adventure was an attempt to kayak in Russia, uh, kayak the Volga River in Russia. And I can tell you now, pretty much everyone has something to say about it. Um, and actually a lot of adventures since, someone's always had, you know, something to say about it. And I think I realized very early on, my key for um, the negatives is to figure out who's saying it and if they have any reason why I should listen to them as an authority on the subject. So for example, if someone was telling me that, that you know, you shouldn't do this because this bit of water is really dangerous, I'd be like, okay, cool. So what you're telling me is that I need to improve my water handling skills or whatever. If it's just some bloke in the pub, I'm just like, well, seriously, who are you and why? Give me a reason why your opinion is relevant to this situation. And I find nine times out of 10, um, it's not, it's just other people really scared of the world that we live in. Um, like, especially you must get this, I'm sure as a solo female traveler, they're like, oh, you can't do that by yourself. It's really dangerous. And it's like, but you ha you can't tell me why you, that I should listen to that. It's just an idea that you have in your head about the world. And I have all this experience over here that tells me something completely different that actually most people are really kind. And actually that I am fully capable of doing this. Um, so yeah, I think you have to filter the criticism before you let it in for one. And secondly, then try and see why someone is saying that to you. Um, so my family are kind of pretty much used to it now, but it was quite difficult in the early stages. I'm like, oh, they're just scared and they're trying to protect me. And it's, you know, so if you can if, if one filter it out and two, see the good intention behind it, because it makes it a bit easier to kind of just soften it and not take it as an attack. Yeah. Um, but the third thing I think is, you know, you've got to protect, you've got to protect your ideas and your weirdness um, and your little spark of madness. And don't, don't, you know, don't need other people to, to, to um, endorse it um, yeah. because it's your dream. So no, nine times out of 10, I don't think most people will get it and they don't have to. And that's okay. I think make it okay. Um, you know, we all have different paths in life, like getting a mortgage and starting a family wasn't for me, but it doesn't mean that I'm criticizing someone over there. It just means that we don't necessarily understand each other's life choices, but that's fine because it's a big, big planet. So I say one of the tactics that I use, which works really well for me now is, is when people are like, oh, you really want to do that or you want to go there is I end up thanking them and say, oh, you know, thanks so much for sharing that with me. Yeah. Move on. And then I basically 100%. forget about it. So I thank them for it because it makes them feel better that they've got to share their opinion about what I'm doing with me. The other yeah. thing which I've realized is, when you when you tell people what you what you want to do, I want to go cycle Pacific Coast Highway. Their responses back to you is basically just telling you what their personal fears are. I 100% agree. So they will basically say, "Are you not worried about X, Y, Z?" And, and that is basically what they are worried about, what they are concerned about. Yeah, so, it's a filter, isn't it? Because we all communicate through our own filters. Um, yeah. So what you'll see is exactly exactly how you just said. Like whatever they're saying is just demonstrating their filter of the world. But I mean, I think um, I, mean, I remember back. So you, uh, you probably quite a few of you know my know my backstory. But you know, worked worked in banking many years ago in London. Got to say two, thirty three. Decided I was going to change my life. Went travelling, and I decided I was going to become an you know an adventurer, and I was going to become a motivational speaker. And I remember I was at um, at a wedding, and I was telling somebody like you know a friend from like university, and they laughed in my face. Like they were literally just like, 
what are you, you know, literally wow. rip me to shreds. But not, when I say rip me to shreds, it wasn't malicious. It was mm. literally just like, what are you thinking? You're, you're crazy. So even though, you know, deep down inside me, that little flame, which was burning about this little idea that I, that I had was strong. Like that was honestly so, so gutting. So it made, what it made me do is keep a lot of things almost like close to my chest yeah. about my goals and ambitions and what I wanted to do until that sort of little flickering flame yeah. was like a full on fire burn. Yeah, I, I do think you have to protect it. You know, I think you learn actually um, who you tell and who you confide in and who you don't. Um, and I, I think you do, like I, I keep a lot of stuff to myself until I'm secure and it's going ahead and all the rest of it. And also you just learn who not to, you know, who are the, who are the cheerleaders and who are the people that are just like, just dampening stuff with their misery and they're like oh you can't do this you know like you you learn quite quickly who those people are so um i'm just gonna make so we've got we've got about we've got about five minutes left oh my goodness it's gone so quickly it's got, it has gone super quickly <laughs> but this is for everybody watching we have an amazing prize ah. for you but you're gonna have to use your thinking no cheating i don't think you'll be able to cheat anyway <laughs> so, as you probably know myself and laura have done some amazing endurance challenges from you know cycling uh, the, the, the Great North Ride, 6,000 kilometers. I've cycled Pacific Coast Highway, 4,000 kilometers. Marathon de Saabs, 250 kilometers. We've done a whole host, which Laura's mentioned, like running for Fort Ventura. <laughs> we want to know if you can guess how many human powered miles me and Laura have done combined. Put your guess down in the comments and the person, oh, we're doing it in kilometers, sorry. Oh. How many human powered <laughs> kilometers have Laura and Sarah done combined over the years? So, um, it not not in a, no. Well, no, the challenges. Like, I think we worked it yeah, out based on our challenges. Yeah, based on our challenges. So, Laura, you, you've I've done I think like six challenges. Not training, not training, just no. the challenges, just the events. Because <laughs> we'd be up in the millions because yeah. we trained so hard, Carol. <laughs> so basically, just how many kilometers that we have done with our challenges combined together. Um, pop, pop your guess down in the comments and the person closest is going to win oh I love these guesses well, I know this is great oh my god they're all coming 33,000 kilometers 29,000 kilometers 16,500 450,000 I don't think we're getting <laughs> close to half a million kilometers but I love that passion we got 77,000 kilometers oh my god it's, it's going too fast <laughs> you've got to be in it to win it yeah. so take a guess have a think what we could you know what we've done pop down your guess there's a link there as well mark's put a link for you to to enter so make sure you check that out as well check that out as well but oh my god so whew, right we are god, I'm, I'm so excited yeah. about everyone's guesses i was I getting really distracted <laughs> um so we've got we've got a couple of minutes left um so laura uh final, any questions or yeah, any final questions but otherwise final words of advice for all of our actually no you know what we should say is me and Laura are both available online to answer any questions, all of that good stuff. So Laura, where's the best place for people to go to find more information? Oh, that is my podcast. To find more information out about you. <laughs> um, yeah, so I can be found on Instagram at Laura Kairos. Same on Facebook, Laura Kairos. And Twitter, it's Kairos Laura. Um, the website is laurakairos.com. So yeah, pretty easy to find. Come and say hello. Fabulous. And Laura's also got an amazing book as well called Kairos. It is laugh out loud. <laughs> Setting the, the theme here. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And um, do you want to just quickly tell everyone what Kairos means? Yeah, um, I do. So I've got a postcard that I was trying to reach. I can't oh. reach it. Um, it. Yeah. Basically, there are two types of time. The ancient Greeks had two, uh, two words for different types of time. So Kronos, we might be very aware of. It's the chronological time. So on your watch, very logical. Kairos is, is something else. It's this magical time when everything lines up so if you've ever experienced some divine serendipity everything just working out and you've got no idea what happened that's kairos time um, and the reason i attached everything to kairos is because i think a lot of us spend a lifetime waiting for things to line up magically you know like oh well i'll do this when this happens um, and i actually figured out a few years ago that actually you get kairos time when you take the first step so I don't think Kairos time finds you. I think you have to get started. Um, and that's when it that's when it happens. You have to be in the arena. You know, you have to to make that first move. Absolutely. And you spell Kairos. K-A-I-R-O-S. <laughs> um, so everybody who is 
is guessing, please use the link that Marcus shared as well. Keep on guessing, keep on putting it in the link. It will make us easier when we go through everything. But I just want to say a um, massive thank you to everybody watching. Thank you, Kim. Um, thank you. Sophie, <laughs> Hannah. Um, okay, I was going to be so um, amazing <laughs> to have you all involved with us. It's been super fun. We hope you've enjoyed it. Thank you, Amanda, uh, Lavinia, thank you so much, Fiona, guys. Lisa. Oh, God, I was going to literally like to carry on. I'm, I'm going to say <laughs> all 100 of you. As, as yeah, you so good to see you guys. But um, yeah, we'll have to say goodbye now. Oh. But yeah, um, I, I'm going to, well, we're probably going to be hanging out in the comments, reply to any comments on there. But just thanks again for everybody for watching. Thank you. To, um, thank you. A massive thank you. Thanks for the book recommendations also. Really yes. enjoying those. <laughs> we love it. We love it. Um, brilliant. Well, take care, everybody. And we will be back with you soon. And also a massive thank you to Alice Brigham for, yeah. for having us on to talk. We obviously love talking. And it's like, shut really? up. Stop talking. <laughs> Stop talking. We'll get that. <laughs> brilliant. Thanks, everyone. Bye, Bye everyone. <laughs>